It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope. CBS News Correspondents, Larry Lasseur and Lou Choppy. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Merton B. Tice, National Commander of the Veterans of Foreign Wars. In recognition of the fact that our country has been through two major wars in a generation, the Congress of the United States last year changed the name of Armistice Day to Veterans Day. Our guest tonight was in World War II, was on the staff of General Matthew Ridgway. He became commander of the veterans of foreign wars last August. Mr. Tice, do you think that the veterans are getting a... Are you satisfied with the break they're getting now from the government and the country? I'm absolutely satisfied with the break that the veterans are getting from a grateful people in America, and I only wish that they could get that same break from the representatives of those people who are in Congress. I don't feel that they have from Congress. Well, what are your chief complaints? Are you thinking in terms of new legislation? No, I'm thinking of bringing back some of the legislation perhaps we had previously because I'm thinking primarily of that veteran who's disabled, who's now in a hospital and needs medical care and a treatment. And as you probably remember, under the Truman administration, there were 2,500 hospital beds taken away. And there's been a further advocation that there be some more taken away. And it's, uh, it's uh, terrible because of this fact, that we have at least on every day of the year 90,000 veterans of our wars and our hospitals today. We have 135,000 hospital beds for, for over 21 million veterans. Now, uh, naturally, all veterans don't take advantage of those uh, rights that they do have, and they pay their own way. But at the same time, we've got a lot of veterans, neuropsychiatric cases and tubercular cases who are hurting their communities, who, uh, who could be productive citizens if that Congress of the United States would give us some more hospital beds and medical care. Well, may I ask you, are you working towards any changes in the, in the veterans' laws then, Mr. Tice? We certainly are, and I've talked with uh, Mr. Higley, the uh, director of the Veterans Administration only recently, and Dr. Joel T. Boone, one of his top men, who's the director of the medical section, and I've talked to congressmen and senators, and we certainly are going to push for that as soon as this new Congress reconvenes in January. Well, is this going to cost uh, the uh, well-known taxpayer more money? I'd say to you what I said to John Phillips, who was the chairman of the subcommittee on appropriations last year. Is it good economy or false economy to have a man who's a neuropsychiatric man who's lost a little something out of his head through no fault of his own when he kills some citizens? Is it false or good economy when a man's got tuberculosis and could be cured and he contaminates his family? So I say, sure, it's sound economy to make productive citizens out of those men. Well, incidentally, how far away do you think we are from universal military training, Commander Tice? This may surprise you a little bit, but I think we're just as far away. I think by June 1st, 1955, we will have what you're referring to as universal military training. It may shock you a little bit, but I'm basing it upon the fact that this Selective Service Act is going to expire at that time in May, and we've got to have some kind of, a, of an act of of having men in uniform as long as we have the threats existing today that do exist. Therefore, I believe we will have a form of universal military training in the substance of the Selective Service Act uh, amended as it exists today. In other words, we'll have universal military training, you think, but we won't call it that. That's right. We can call it whatever we want to, but we're going to accomplish the same end. Well, Commander Tice, uh, could you tell us what uh, the VFW thinks of as a good UMT plan? We think this. We think that if you will give a man six months of basic training and then uh, have him committed that he must serve uh, maybe six more years in a reserve status, going two, two weeks out of the year to a training camp, and certainly every once a month at least having some training or classroom work, that then we will integrate uh, sooner or later uh, a, a reworkable, callable reserve for any emergency and we'll cut down on that standing army of today, which is three million uh, in, under, uh, in uniform. I don't know whether you realize it or not, but every man in uniform, whether it's Army, Navy, Marine Corps, or anything else, it costs the government $12,000 a year, 
And I can see if they'll adopt what we're advocating in the Veterans of Foreign Wars for a workable program of building up our reserves, that we can cut down that standing army to one and a half million men. Now, that can't be done overnight. Our plan is to, to more or less kind of have it by evolution rather than revolution. And uh, that's the plan we're trying well, to Commander Tice, as you say, many of these things have an economic base. Now, one of the arguments I've heard against universal military training by a, a responsible official is that uh, technology is fast making the prospects of a third world war into a technical war. And these people feel that the men who are going to fight this next war are going to be technicians. And they should be, therefore, trained by business in scientific training now rather than taking them out of business life or scientific life, making the government train them in special schools. Well, of course, that's being done right at the present time and, and in many fields. At the same time, I'm thinking of what General Hershey told me only about a month ago about a, a man who was in his employ, went into, was called back in and from the reserve. He took a ship that was a Norwegian ship across the, the waters and came back and he was seeing General Hershey and General Hershey ho said, how in the world could you come in and take that ship when you didn't know anything about it? And he said, well, it took me a couple of days to find out how to run it. I think we're overemphasizing this uh, great, highly technical man that they're thinking of in those terms. We better keep our mind on the man. You can't take real estate without putting your feet on it. And that, that's taken by the man who's carrying that M1 rifle over his shoulder normally. In other words, you think we're, we're uh, overemphasizing the possibility of a push-button war. Oh, that's way out of the picture, I would say, and it's too bad because it may, lure, uh, it may uh, lull our own citizenry to sleep. That there, were, there isn't any push-button war, I don't think, in the offing at all. It's going to be just the same old thing, that the war is terrible, and it's going to be fought along the same basic lines it always has ever since Napoleon. Well, uh, of course, the VFW go looks into other things besides uh, Veterans Affairs. And I was thinking especially of that hullabaloo last year up in Norwalk, Connecticut, when there were charges that the VFW had organized a vigilante committee to uh, search out uh, un-American suspects. And what's the situation in <laughs> regard to that now? Well, to me, it was very humorous because, of, the, of course, we have no vigilante committees. They're prohibited under our Constitution and bylaws. We've never had them. But what, what took place there is going to take place tomorrow and the next day. We've been charged by letter by J. Edgar Hoover. We were also asked by President Roosevelt, by President Truman, and also by President Eisenhower. And every loyal American citizen has been to report any subversive to the Federal Bureau of Investigation, which is a proper agency to investigate them. Under no circumstances do we ever evaluate uh, any possible evidence that we might think we'd have about somebody else. We certainly don't make any investigation, and we have no committees on any levels, post, department, the state, we call it the department, or a national level. Commander, do you have any secret committees? We have no secret committees whatsoever. We have no secret workings. So, well, Commander, some of these things might lead to abuses. Is the VFW set up to uh, seek out and uh, slap down abuses of this? Well, perhaps I haven't yet clearly spoke myself. The VFW does not seek out those people. It's only when that yeah, they're exposed to it and they see it and then they feel a sworn duty and obligation actually as an American citizen to report it. In fact, it isn't the VFW. I charge every one of our 160 million people in the United States should do the same thing. Well, do you feel that the anti-communist bill passed by the last Congress meets your aim sufficiently? It uh, certainly is a step in the right direction. You know that we advocated that in 1926 at our national encampment at El Paso, Texas, that the the Communist Party be outlawed, and of course, it, we call it our finest hour in VFW history. We're very happy it was passed. Well, speaking of the Communist, as the head of a major veterans organization, do you think there's anything we should do about these continuing incidents of the Soviet Union's pilots shooting down our reconnaissance planes? I certainly do, and I think we should go further than that. I, I think that we should tell Russia that you can't go in another step further. I think it's a tragedy and a travesty that they've been able to subjugate over 800 million people in the world today, and actually our own government and our own administration hasn't had a clear-cut, firm policy on it. I say that they've gone too far already, and this isn't anything to be investigated. I think that's something that we should take action on right now. Now, that certainly doesn't mean war. And it means one thing to me, it means avoiding war. If what do you think we could actually do? What could we say to them? Well, we can say one thing, and that is we, we certainly should carry out exactly what the orders were originally 
that if we're ever fired upon by anybody to fire back and to give them everything we have once they have open fire. Is there, do you think that the VFW and its local organizations, and I see many of their organizations all over the countryside, I'm always very glad to see them. Do you think they are playing a big enough role in civil defense these days? I certainly don't, and we're urging them this year to do a lot more than has been done in the past. It hasn't been, I'm very frank to, uh, to say, one of our major programs. It is this year, and we're doing everything possible to coordinate and cooperate all of our efforts and every one of our personnel with Val Peterson and everybody connected with the civil defense. I think the American public is uh, very, very indifferent to that program that may well spell the difference, if it ever comes, of life and death. I, I hesitate to be one of those bell ringers or whatever they call them, but by golly, I'll tell you, it, it could be very bad that we haven't made proper preparations in our civil defense. And we're going to urge and encourage and give every single effort we can this year with our 10,000 posts and 7,000 ladies auxiliaries. Well, we're all for you on that. And thank you very much, Commander Tice, for being with us tonight. Thank you very much. The opinions expressed on the Longines Chronoscope were those of the speakers. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was... Larry Lasseur and Lou Choppy. Our distinguished guest was Merton B. Tice, National Commander of the Veterans of Foreign Wars. To give a Longine watch this Christmas is to give just about the finest watch made anywhere in all the world. And happily, a Longine watch is a gift that almost everyone can afford. Now, for example, there are many truly beautiful Longine models priced as low as $71.50. The choice of styles and of models is almost unlimited. For ladies, Longines creates superb examples of the jeweler's art, exquisite in taste and finish, perfect for every dress and for every occasion. For men, Longines produces watches of every type, watches for dress and for sport. Longines automatic watches, the most advanced in the world. Longines waterproof and shock-resistant watches for rugged service. Longines chronograph watches for sportsmen and for scientists. And every Longines watch, whether for a lady or for a gentleman, and regardless of the price you pay, is made to the same unique standards of excellence that have won for Longines 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, highest honors for accuracy in fields of precise timing. And this statement is true throughout the world. The Longines watch that you give this Christmas is not only about the finest watch made anywhere in the world, but equally important, it's the watch of highest prestige. And may I repeat that you may buy and proudly give a Longines watch this Christmas for as little as $71.50. Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored Christmas gift, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitmore, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches.